Okay. Plus. All right. So just a gentle reminder, you are being recorded. Um, anything you say will be recorded, but not necessarily held against you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> and that's got to go both ways. I swear if somebody pulls this video off of YouTube and goes, can you believe what the pastor said? I'm going to be upset. <laughs> you would do yes, the Miranda rights, yeah. I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going to get out of all the um, get some fabric for Joanne's. And he's going to watch his watch hands. hands. He didn't say you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what Steve said. Right, the Miranda right. Okay. There you go. I'll let you finish it from there. So maybe it rained more than that thing. Yeah. I think it rained a little bit. <clears throat> Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, morning, we're... everybody. Afternoon, morning. I think. That's Michelle, I think. Actually, that um, tomato plant's leaning out on the lawn. All righty. Well, let's get started because, as you've already discovered, I like to run over. And to help <laughs> that, I've given you three pieces instead of one this week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so well, I want to start. Okay. Having nothing to do with Wendell Berry whatsoever, just every once in a while, I like to ask my groups, tell me something good. It rained. Rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. The corn needed to rain. Yes. Yeah, the corn out behind the parsonage was starting to look uh, look dangerously spiky, if you know what I mean. So, right. yeah, the rain was great. Start to roll up. My my pumpkins that I have planted in my clothes basket have blossoms. Awesome. <laughs> Um, I got to babysit my great granddaughters this past weekend. That was special. Hadn't done that for months. Excellent. Yeah, very, that was cool. Good. good, good, good. And I'm going to share something really big today. Today is Tommy Mayo's birthday. Oh, you're yeah. too late. Oh, we already did that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I know. I know Vicky, yeah. Tommy wasn't saying anything. Vicky That's said, I'm just going to grab this glory and run with it. All right. She didn't even give me a chance. <laughs> I missed that part. But anyway. <laughs> we didn't well, sing happy our, birthday. No. Oh, Steve said we didn't sing. We the, didn't sing happy birthday. No. That, That's okay. <laughs> oh, I think we should. Can no. we? No. Yeah. Yes. It won't work yes. on Zoom. No, no, no. no, it won't work on Zoom. We will we all can. be out of sync. That's yeah, true. That, it is. It, 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 each one will be just. <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, so it would sound like row, row, row your boot. No, it would sound like, <laughs> I don't Except know not what. not good. <laughs> when you see these choruses and all do it, they're not doing it all at once. They're edited videos to put them all together. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. All righty. Well, let's fly into our text for today. Let's see if we can try to get through these. Um, and so, as you have already noticed, um, we're moving out of the genre this week of essays and into the genre of poetry, um, which I, I think I said in my email and will say again to you personally, um, comes with a great deal, of, great deal of fear and trepidation from me. Um, I remember sitting in a college course and we were, and I, 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 can, I cannot remember the poet, but I do remember the image. We were reading this poem, and it was about chickens in a chicken coop, which you would think would be like, that's up my alley. I understand that, you know, and it was a beautiful day. Apparently, it was a blue sky, you know, and, the, and the, the red coop and the white chickens running around and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I remember my professor asking, like, asking us, like, tell us about this imagery. How are you processing this? And we're all like trying to guess at it and trying to figure out what's going on. And she's like, no, no, no. She's like, red, red, red coop, white chickens, blue sky. This is an analogy for America. And I'm like, why can't it just be chickens running around the yard? Like, why does it have to be America? <laughs> I was so confused by that. But over the years, I've learned a little bit. I've learned this much about poetry. Um, 
And hopefully, and I have found Barry's poetry to be accessible for me because the images that he uses make sense to me. Um, and so I hope in some way they were, they were somewhat accessible for you, and we'll try to pull them apart a little bit. But as I've shared my experience with poetry, I'm wondering, do you all have experience with poetry? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you have a favorite poem or a favorite poet that maybe you read for some of you who enjoy this sort of thing? Um, just kind of wondering where the group is at today. Well, I hate to brag, but in ninth grade, I oh. had a poem published in the National Anthology of Poetry or something like that. It doesn't Wonderful. look like you're upset about telling us this story right now. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell I'm not going to recite the poem. Oh. I'm not going to do it. Can, can you give it to me one day under the guise of pastoral confidentiality? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've written some poetry. That's 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 interesting. This is the rhyming type, of course. Well, mm -hmm. I, it's yeah. poetry yes. like anything else. Yeah, I I have an experience. It was in uh, grad school. Um, it was a um, part of a counseling program, and it was uh, writing. And the assignment was uh, write a poem. At the time, I was working in Baltimore City, urban. Um, and there were a lot of, um, you know, Baltimore City has a lot of um, young girls who were pregnant. And at the time, there were also a lot of murders and random shootings. So I, I, I wrote a poem. I don't remember. I, I'm not like the other Mike who can remember his poem to recite. But the, the, the point is that it was quite emotional. And it was empathizing with the vulnerability of these young girls in the city. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, in the class, um, uh, I, I recited the poem. And I was kind of struck by the reaction from the instructor. Her first comment was, you didn't write that poem. I didn't. Quite, I've never had an experience like that before, mm -hmm. so I didn't know what to say or do at the moment. Yeah. So I just left it alone. And you know, now that we're taking a um, uh, looking at some poems now, it brought all that back. And I wish I had confronted or or at least asserted on my own behalf that yeah, it's possible for a male to empathize with some some other situation that you typically don't expect the male to empathize with. So that's all I wanted to. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And it gets to be very personal and very intimate, you know, and, and, uh, and yeah, I hear some of that coming out in your story. Um, yes. Fascinating. Hmm. Any favorite poems out there or poets <clears throat> or those of you who have <laughs> poetry? I know back, back to when I was in, uh, took the opening sometime for Chani school. Uh, this is back 30 years ago, but I used Helen Steiner Rice a lot. And mm. she, she had a poem for about every kind of situation possible. And yeah. I, I enjoyed her poetry. Yeah, she mm. is. Very good. I really like yeah, Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver, uh, yes, um, thank you. And I think Wendell Berry um, has a very similar like cadence and, and also obviously subject matter. I totally agree, yeah. Um, one of the websites I stumbled on as I was kind of reading through stuff was both of them have a poem called Wild Geese. Um, and putting the two of them together seems to be a really popular poetic thing to do. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Mary Oliver is one of my favorites as well. Um, so. I, I like Robert Frost also. Frost is good, yes. yeah. I do too. I like his. Yeah. And Robert so Frost. if you like Frost, I suspect Barry <laughs> resonated with you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Barry, same time. Yep. Very dialed into setting, let's put it that way. Yeah, right. And I like that. Yeah, me too. So, well, good. Well, I hope... I, can, I was just going to say, I can remember different teachers really liked poetry. And certain teachers had us recite, memorize poems. <laughs> and I can remember that in high school and, and uh, elementary school. Yeah. There were certain teachers that really stress poetry and mm -hmm. had a snoring poetry. I, I remember, I, I just real quick, when our son died in 1976, he was only, he was just short of three years old. Mm -hmm. And Brenda Lee Stocksdale had, 
been, she was only, well, she was only Brenda 16. Lee Lyons at that time, because she was only 16. Yeah. And she came up with a poem mm, that uh, the minister read at the funeral, which neither one of us could have read, read it because <laughs> it was so well put together. Mm. And we shared that particular poem, poem with a, a lot of different people through the years yeah. that have lost a, a small child. Hmm. But she she just did a wonderful job on that. Well, this because is an I excellent. Think, because I think it's truly a gift. It is. And it is, yeah. People with it right, but I think it's really a gift. And Brother well, this, Lee definitely is, has that gift. Yeah. This is an excellent jumping off point for talking about Barry's poetry. Um, because I hope... As you were watching Stephen Dot talk about that poem, like especially in Steve, I saw in your face trying to communicate emotion, like saying, yeah. like, even though we weren't there, I don't think any of us were there, trying to say how powerful and moving that poem was. And that is what poetry is, is, is inclined to do for us. It reaches down into something deeper. So it's worth saying at the outset, as we fly into these poems, that while all literature is art in some way, shape, or form, which means the essays that we've talked about, I think even journalism in its own way, even when it's reporting facts or opinions, all literature is art. But poetry is art in a, in a different way and in a powerful way. Just as an artist will use colors and brush strokes to craft an image, and some of you might remember, I tried to do a little bit of this with the painting in the sanctuary, trying to look at how that painting uses color and imagery to, to communicate to us. So a poet will use words in the same way. And so if essays are intended to communicate with our minds, offering ideas or facts or arguments, poetry is intended to communicate with our hearts. It offers emotion and feeling and experience. One of the problems we have as a society, and forgive me for going all societal, but I think we are, we are in such a data slash technological slash information society that we are generally underdeveloped in the ways of communication that speak to something more than our mind. And I think this is why a lot of us struggle with poetry because we're like, it's trying to talk to us in a different language. It's a language we can learn, a language of the heart, but we have to pay attention to it. It's going to take us a little bit more time to understand. <coughs> But it's no accident, for those of us who are committed to a life of faith, a life of goodness, um, who may call ourselves Christian, it's no accident that the most significant book of poetry in the scriptures, which are the Psalms, are also the most significant book of prayer that we have. Sometimes we try to make prayer into the language of information, and it doesn't come to us in that way. Prayer is in the language of poetry. And so this practice of slowing down and listening and letting the language of the emotion speak is an important, is an important skill for those of us who seek to live a life of faith. To this point, um, one of my favorite pastors, um, who he recently passed away, but, and I've never met him, but um, read many of his books, um, Eugene Peterson, had this to say about poetry. And remember, this is coming from a pastor who's interested in developing spirituality in others. He said in an interview, he said, the poet forces you to do something that is very important for prayer. Slow down. You can't speed read a poem. You need to shift out of your normal asphalt driving to work, being productive mentality. You need to be submissive to a reality you didn't make. You have to read the poem three times before you start to get the hang of it. It means you aren't in control of it. There is somebody who perceives some truth that you don't. It's humbling and maybe even a little humiliating. But as we, as people of faith, hear the words humbling and humiliating, we also hear the word humility. This doesn't mean we need to be ashamed. It means we simply need to submit ourselves to the words as they are coming to us. And so poetry takes time. We can't just read it. It has to be heard and felt and absorbed. So what I want to do this today is that I would like to spend a little time, because none of these poems are particularly long. I actually found readings of each of these poems online. And so I would like to play them and to have you hear them 
after I imagine you've spent some time reading them, and if you're just, crash, if you're just cramming this course today and haven't actually read them, that's fine too. But I want, I want to hear them and put that alongside of your having read them, and then together we'll try to pull them apart a little bit, try to pull, extract some meaning, and then hopefully they'll snap back together in some way that communicates some kind of an experience or an emotion to us. Okay, and so, but today I really want to focus in on how these poems make you feel from the pen of Wendell Berry, okay? And so, and hopefully these, this poetry will help us continue to develop an understanding of how Wendell Berry sees the world. So, does that sound like a good path forward for everybody? Yes. Right, so I have not tried sharing... I'm, I've got to figure out how, I'm going to try this YouTube thing. If it doesn't work, please let me know. There's a couple things I can try. But two of them, two of the poems are actually read by Barry himself. So I hope that actually hearing his voice will give, will give some texture to his words. And so I'd like to begin today with How to Be a Poet. Okay, the poem How to Be a Poet. And so I'm going to detach my mic. And I'm going to play this, and you all tell me if you can hear it. This is Wendell Berry's reading of, oh, no, that's Wild Geese. Here it is, How to Be a Poet. How to Be a Poet, to Remind Myself. Written and read by Wendell Berry. Make a place to sit down. Sit down, be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work growing older, patience, for patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. <laughs> Breathe with unconditional breath, the unconditioned air, shun electric wire, communicate slowly, live a three-dimensioned life, stay away from screens, stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it. Of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers prayed back to the one who prays, make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. So that reading, um, if you would like to follow up, if any of you are familiar with the uh, podcast series uh, On Being, um, that is, that is uh, Barry read that as part of the On Being series. And so if you wanted to go back and listen to more of that, you're certainly welcome to. And so I'm going to ask um, just your initial observations of this poem. And let me reiterate, as always, there are no right answers. This is the glory of poetry. Um, it's also the frustration of poetry. But I just want to know what you heard, what you saw, what you felt as you both read it and as you heard it. Michelle, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> okay. well, first of all, I realized over the years, poetry does not have to run. Mm -hmm. And that surprised me. I think I was taught in school that it had to. But anyway. Being almost 64 years old, I'm still learning. But anyway, um, this basically happened last evening. Um, I when, when I picked this uh, my readings up at church, Sam, I kind of went, Sam, really? This yeah, really? was, I mean, I think I read it five times, and it was still somewhere up over my head. Well, I read it about five more times. So then what I did is each line I underlined, I question marked, and everything. And then I actually wrote a verse afterwards. It, oh. it was like, okay, I'm going to do some homework here. <laughs> so I don't know. But I communicate slowly. Um, stay away from anything that obscures it in its place. And also, I think one that finally sunk in was 
make the best you can of it. And it's, it's actually the last paragraph. Um, out of silence, like prayers, pray back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. So when I left my house to come to church to pick up the papers for those who don't know me, um, I'd say I was, I was away for about 35 minutes. So this actually happened on my way to church. And part of it, this, when I mentioned the sunflower fields, they I saw a few days ago. But it's only a couple miles from where I live. It's actually back Cherrytown Road where Vicki and Tommy live. I just kind of summed it up and I said, I made it as a thank you prayer. <coughs> Dear God, thank you for the sunflower fields close by for the 19 deer grazing in a soybean field as I drive to my church. It was quiet in church when I stopped by last evening. However, a friend there checking the church's garden. People chatting under our church pavilion. And 15 minutes later, when I got home, the thunder sounding as we received rain. Thank you, God, because it's badly needed. Now I wait for a friend to visit me this evening. I will read this again before I sleep tonight. With me, God, all is well. It's quite the poem. It's really awesome. We'll break your poem down next. <laughs> <laughs> See, and this is why this is why I I've I've quit my belief that there are some people who just can't get poetry. Even though this this confused you, you actually responded to it. I think in some really powerful and really emotional ways. That's interesting. I had to read it about ten times. Well, that's the idea. That was my instruction. You got to read it more than <laughs> once. Other places you were drawn to in this poem. And hi, Monique. We're in How to Be a Poet. <laughs> um, I actually took. Well, so I'm down in my, I'm kind of multitasking, so working because it's our busy week, but I have, when I read that, the one thing that stood, actually, the only thing I have next to me is a Bob, but on a sticky note, I took and wrote that patience joins time to eternity. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it stuck with me. It just did. And I felt like, like I kept running over my head and I felt like I had to write it down and I had to stick it to where I can see it. Mm -hmm. So that, that verse of patience joins time to eternity. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts? And we'll come back to that line, I assure you. Um, I, uh, I just come up with one word. Through the whole thing, I just think, I, I think of tranquility. Mm. I think everything, I mean, it was just a very peaceful reading for me. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I just loved everything about it. You know, I just really, really liked it. Yeah. So it, it created a feeling. One mm -hmm. might say an experience, like you had an experience. It would be difficult to be difficult to communicate to another, but there was something internally that it was mm -hmm. doing to you. Very good. Any other thoughts? Any other places where your your mind went? Rob, did I see your hand? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, there he is. You know, so when I... It was interesting to, see, to read a poem about how to be a poet. So it was you know, metacognitive or something about that. The one thing I found that, that jarred me the most, and I'm still not, still trying to figure it out, is there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. And I found that to be jarring in the sense that there, there, you can't have a place that's neither of those. It's either sacred or desecrated. And I found that to be really opposite in that fashion. So I, I, I don't have any other thoughts on it other than this really struck me. It was like, well, you just can't have a ordinary, ordinary old. <laughs> I would certainly wouldn't call my office sacred, but I wouldn't call it desecrated either. So, you know. so I found that kind of, of an interesting three, three lines of the, of the poem here. Yeah. No, I like it an interesting concept though that um kind of wasn't where i was going but this the whole thing about the the sacred places i guess um it's saying that ordinary is sacred yeah. the ordinary life ordinary things like the poem what was it um is it michelle that wrote every you know the, the sunflower yes. yeah. 
Yes. So th- they're sacred in the ordinary. Mm-hmm. Well, what I, I, I was noticed a couple, I have a couple of random comments and then I'll reply. But I noticed um, the beginning of the poem talked about sit down and be quiet. And the end of the poem is like, okay, you're doing this. Just don't disturb the silence. That's right. Um, so it kind of begins with the, this theme and it ends with this theme. And I just wanted to add another random thought that I was kind of rumbling around in my head. I was never like the poem person. I, maybe I'm more cerebral and I need to slow down and, and get into the emotion of it. But I worked in mental health and with pretty severely impacted um, people who maybe they had they had street knowledge but they weren't like stellar students but we ran sometimes on some cycles we ran these poetry groups and I was like amazed by the creativity and the emotion and the heartfeltness of people that I worked with that wrote these things I did writing groups too and art groups and things like that I like people like the human condition the human mind has a great ability to speak from the heart through all of these arts like sam alluded to in the beginning but that's where i was drawn to is the quiet he's telling you to be quiet and listen and i think maybe i need to do that Hmm. as far as the sacred and desecrated i kind of took that like there are no unsacred places no matter where you are you can call on God, like God's there, and unless you completely wipe him out. So I kind of took that as like sacred and desecrated. Mm-hmm. I, will, I, I will say the one thing that reminded me when I read that about sacred or desecrated, uh, and I'm not a poetry person, I, I take a while to actually think back to the last poem I read um, to do it in this way that wasn't a class. And it struck me, I remember a few years ago buying, I can't remember what the name of the book was, but it was written by, I believe, Ira Zepp at uh, then Western Maryland College. And he had some thoughts and poems in there and uh, a real thin book. And there was one in there about, he was talking about just spaces around Westminster, like sacred spaces around Westminster. And one was about Belgrave Square and a few others. And so just reading that thought kind of connected me back to you know, take, taking a, um, take a class with Ira Zepp, and he certainly was a guy who would, who would try to make you think and make you be uncomfortable and push you in different ways, which, which you kind of hope for in, in, you know, in a lot of those settings and stuff. You're supposed to grow and challenge your beliefs. So that's about the only thing I connected it to was something separate from a class, it was a, but it was connected to someone I knew from a few years ago. But he talked a lot about these sacred spaces and stuff. Yeah. No, I think it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting uh, point to connect it to other writers and to see because discover thinking about how other writers use language will help us clarify how this writer that we happen to be dealing with uses language. One of the things that we've <laughs> already discovered about Barry, and we saw this last time in a Native Hill. You remember when he said, you know, I, I was I was born five years too early to kind of understand, you know, understand the the times that I live in, um, you know. He always seems to want to cut across the grain. Is that is that something like he? If the whole world's going in one direction, Barry wants to go in the other direction. It seems to me like as as we've gotten to know his personality over two different two different things, and so so I think, and I'm just offering this, and want to want to pull this apart a little bit, and then like I said, we'll let it snap back together. Is I think this poem is a good illustration of how he wants to use movement which is odd because the first thing he tells you to do is sit down and not move. But I think this poem is about movement. So for instance, it's broken up into three stanzas. And and if we look at what the first word in each one of those stanzas is, we can actually see a movement from stanza to stanza. So we go from (coughs) make, which is an action word, to breathe, which is an action word, finally to accept, which is also an action word. And if we put that structure in place, and you're free to argue with me about whether that's the best way to structure this poem, but if you put that in place, what you start to see is a lot of doing or action or command words that happen. So, you must depend, shun, (coughs) communicate, stay away. 
There is a lot of, and so there's actually a lot of commands to do action. And so I think what he does is use a lot of action to help us understand how to be not just poets, but better people. I think this isn't actually about those of us who want to write words. I mean, we all, we, we could all try to be Mike Driscoll as he, <laughs> as he leaves um, and to write, to write poems, um, but it's really about how to be a human being. And so I wonder, as you put those three things together, <coughs> breathe and accept, what does that movement kind of look like or feel like to you? What does it look like to move from making to breathing to accepting as he puts it in this language? I, I think it's harmony. Um, when, when you are in solitary prayer, when you're meditating, you, you encounter certain truths mm -hmm. about yourself, perhaps your perception of God's will. So to me, that last stanza is to learn to trust the truths that you encounter, they will serve you well as you harmonize yourself with God's will. Hmm. Yeah. I think that spirituality is definitely present here and illustrating that's a really important point. That's where he's trying to get us, I think, um, mm -hmm. to be aware of, of a reality larger than ourselves. Other thoughts about this movement from making to breathing to accepting? Um, I really like that you said that, you know, this poem isn't necessarily teaching us all how to be poems because I, you know, have no poets. I have no interest in being yeah. a poet. <laughs> when I read it, you know, I really <clears throat> like, hey, this is really good advice for me when I sit down and want to, you know, communicate with God or have a quiet time um, with God. Make a space, you know, don't just sit down anywhere, like make yourself aware and present, breathe, um, and accept, you know, just have yourself being open to listening to whatever it is that he is going to speak to you in that time. And for me, I think it really ends with this idea of kind of dependency on something bigger than ourselves. Like we were saying, I know a lot of times we like to just make everything for ourselves and not accept, um, you know, whatever that God is offering to us. And so I really like that you broke it down the make, breathe, accept, and it really points to me towards dependency, um, you know, that trust in God's will and where he's leading us. Thank you. No. Well, words well, well spoken and, and certainly well taken. I, I, um, I, I like that as well, but I, I think um, in addition that this poem is, reflects his, his, just life understanding that we've read thus far. Like I kind of saw a couple things that, that came out for me, like the make sure you know, make sure you're humble at the beginning. Like what, like he says, any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. <laughs> like it's not, it's like our normal reaction would be any, any uh, readers who don't like your poems well, then <laughs> doubt because you know, the world tells you that, you know, everything you do is great. And he's saying the reverse. He's right. Keep yourself humble, my friends. Like if somebody praises your poetry, um, just like doubt it. Like just that's not where you get your your affirmation. And, and I think that speaks to our need to get our affirmation from God. And then I actually think, Robert, that uh, Barry would argue that your office is sacred um, because you breathe in it and you're sacred. And, and so it, it can't not be sacred because you exist in it and, and it, is your, it is of you and you are of God. And so that, the, even that passage, and I love you linking it, Sam, to, to the breathing part. To me, that last statement speaks to this kind of overall sacredness of creation and the overpowering capacity of God's creation and that she creates all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so anyways, I'll stop there. I love having a priest on this call. <laughs> what role- You're a priest. I'm, what's that? 
Do I, <laughs> um, I want to ask, what role does place play? Because one of the things we can do is we can let this, we can let poetry kind of float into the atmosphere. That's exactly the thing Barry doesn't want you to do. And so what role does place play in this poem? have an answer to that but i have a question related to that even better i'm i'm contemplating what you said and i like the way you broke it down into the three well it was already broken down but apparently i needed guidance um the the second stanza talks about things you shouldn't do shun electric wire um stay away from screens that's a good it, it is ironic. Let's just name that. But So I keep, <laughs> keep looking at, yeah, it is kind of ironic. <laughs> Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. I keep, it keeps, that line keeps popping out. And then you said, what's place all about? And I, but that line keeps like, what does that mean? What do people think that means? Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. Hmm. I'll offer it to the group. I think that goes back to last week, the difference between a road and a path. Like stay, stay away from what's, what's projected onto place. Mm-hmm. Find instead what naturally emerges from place. I, I, don't think, I don't think Wendell Berry can write without it being about place. He can't. Yeah. He can't. <laughs> essentially mean just be grounded like place i'm grounded i need to sit down in my safe zone where do we experience things that obscure us to place like what are some of our daily experiences we might not think about as obscuring us to place but might be might actually do just that buying bananas in the grocery store that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. So food that is comes from all over the world. Right. It doesn't speak of this place where I'm consuming it. It speaks of some other place, but I don't have access to anything about that place. I just have this, this object that comes from who knows where and was brought by who knows whom. Yeah. Um, and it, it obscures both sides of, you know, both places. Kevin, that's Man, a killer what observation. What say about Thank my you. spice cabinet? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Some truth to that too. Yeah. I think in today's world, it, finding a, a, a place like that is requires a lot of pre-planning to make sure the phone's not going to ring, the doorbell is not going to ring. Uh, you know, if you're a parent with young kids they're not gonna come running into the room or whatever it really it it takes a lot of forethought and preparation i think and time of day may has probably got a lot to do with it also well you're speaking to intentionality and that's exactly where i see barry beginning like in this poem barry starts with not just sit down he gives very specific almost childish instructions make a place to sit down and then sit down and then be quiet like we could all presume that but he's like no actually you're not good at that (laughs) he's not accusing you and me individually but he's saying we're not good at that so here are the very baby steps make a place then sit then be quiet and so i think he's saying i an, an identical thing to what you're saying there has to be an intentionality to it yeah i mean i read those first lines in the beginning and I was definitely look at the, looking at the intentionality of a place he was saying you know basically create a space for you to be with God or to commune with creation or whatever it is and then I think about all the times where I've tried doing that and I get so frustrated at all the little things that happen like in Liberia you know I'm in a pretty rural area but motorbikes go by and they're like louder than than anything <laughs> I'm used to, you know, that's in that place already. And so, you know, I think, okay, there's no point in doing this, you know, trying to sit down and be intentional. And then I go down to the lines where he talked about, there are no unsacred places, you know, and 
me having to remind myself that I'm never going to find the most perfect place, but always making the best of what I can get from a certain place mm -hmm. at a certain time. So it's both that intentionality, but also accepting what you have yeah. access to. I think that's like such a huge point. Um, because I think when he says be quiet, he didn't say like, make it quiet. He said, be quiet, which mm -hmm. I think is more of an internal Oof. thing. Um, because I think, is, is it Anna or Anna? Anna? Um, I think what Anna is, is saying is like, there's, we miss everything if we're going for perfection. If we like, don't want the motorbikes, if we don't want the construction noise. Um, and you were saying, Sam, like, you know, something where we've missed something and I, I haven't had a car this week and I don't drive my car that often, but it's amazing what you pick up when you walk everywhere. Um, the places particularly that you might drive a car to. Yeah. And then you see all the things you've missed. Yeah. And that's a way of being quiet as mm -hmm. well. There's nothing to do with sound. I want to make sure that I say, um, and then we're going we're gonna to bring this poem to a close. We're only getting through two of these today. Um, and we might not get through two of them. Um, but I did want to say one of the places that often obscures place, as Robin was asking, I want you to hear it from a pastor, is church. That there are ways in, like, I have been in churches that other than the sports shirts that somebody will wear, you know, I wouldn't, inside the building, I wouldn't know where I am. You know, I, it, that, you know, you could pick that particular building up, set it in any other spot, and I, I would not know where I was. And sometimes church can be so inside of its own walls that it obscures the place because we're so worried on this heavenly connection that we forget that an equal command is to love our neighbor as ourself, to view our neighbor. And so being aware of that at times and saying there are times that we do obscure the places where we're at, I think is something, I, 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 I at least want you to hear me offer that as something that we've so internalized being obscured from place that sometimes that it shows up in our very faith and we're not aware of it because it seems like the most natural thing in the world where Barry is inviting us to say, actually, much like Kevin said with food, like, like the, ch the place where we worship should be reflective of the place where we actually are. And sometimes we don't spend enough time thinking about that. And so I wanted to offer that as one of the things that I often wrestle with, like how do I pastor in a way that reflects the place where I actually am? I just killed the vibe. I hate it when I do that. <laughs> well, I, I just, I, I'm thinking about that, Sam, and, and as a pastor as well, like right now, I don't know where you guys are in, in worship in the midst of COVID, but we're in the midst of kind of planning what church looks like um, in, on September 6th, when we're going to be open to a modified, um, a, you know, modified service and stuff and everybody's going to be masked and I, I'm having a hard time grappling as a person who's looking out into that sacred space and not everybody can fit in and because or not everyone can come because of their own health issues and how does that I think I think our online service is more sacred right now than what we are putting together for our in-person mm -hmm. place. So it's kind of weird to grapple with how is church place in the midst of this chaotic mm -hmm. time. Maybe in that, that way, this poem becomes remarkably relevant. Yeah. All of a sudden, these agrarian themes are right up in front of us, not because we all want to be farmers, but because place actually is important. And we're trying to figure out what that looks like. And, and so, no, I think that's a, a point really well taken. So I would like to offer kind of my last, my last word on the subject, then I'll offer your last, then I'll invite your last word on the subject, and we'll move to another poem, because I want to make sure we try to at least get through two of these. Um, but as I think about... Um, as I read this poem over and over and over again, this idea of make, breathe, to accept, um, and this movement that is present in this poem that is about stillness, what I think he's saying, what I hear him saying is that we must internalize our place in order to in, in, in order to be open to and live well in the place where we are. I think this is a poem about living well. I think most of Barry's poems are about living well. 
And so what he's saying, and Ab- Abby, I love the way that you finagled that. He doesn't say make it quiet. He says be quiet. That's really, that's really close attention to language. He says be in your place completely. And as you sit and are still, what, di- what you discover is not so much yet what's around you, but your internal disposition. He's saying you need to come to terms with what is internal to you which is what you must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill. And I love that he says, more of each than you have. Come to a place where you acknowledge your own reality, your own place, the place that, that, that your very being is. Come to terms with that. And then he says, breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air, which is this act. It's the most fundamental human act of taking that thing which is outside of us and putting it inside of us. It is literally taking a piece of the place and sticking it inside of our very selves. Eating is the other thing that we do most regularly that takes our external environment and actually makes it internal to us. But he uses this notion of breathing to say, make your external realities internal to you and let them mingle with the internal reality that is already yourself. And this is what, and he says, this is such a delicate process. This is why communicate slowly. Don't let, don't let it all out too quick because you're still figuring out what that, what that intersection inside of you looks like. Stay away from screens because they're going to want to import other things into you which will muddy the waters. And he says there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Do the work of attending to the sacredness that is present in everything. And if it has been desecrated, then do the work of noticing that as well. And then ultimately, then he comes to this third spot where he says, accept what comes from silence, make the best of it. This is where as a poet, he's saying, you want to put something back out into the world, but accept it and that will naturally come out of you. Out of the little words that come out of the silence, make a poem that does not disturb the silence from whence it came. Don't practice the violence of disturbing the reality. And we talked about violence last time. Path and Road was really, a, really good, a really good draw. Um, Don't let your existence be a violence on the place that is around you, but rather contribute to it, but don't disturb the silence from which it came. And so this is how place works in this poem and how Barry understands how this works. And so that's how I read this poem. It's a poem about motion, motion that sits, breathes in, and then slowly and carefully puts back out into the world, which is what it means to be a good human, the way that Barry understands it. That's how I read this poem. I'll give you the last word, and then we're going to absolute chaos with our next poem. (laughs) I thought it was interesting to hear him read the poem, because I read it, um, my phrasing was different than his, you know, yeah. when his intentional, how he separated and how he, for me, a poem, I always read like one line at a time, but with him, that line carried over sometimes right. into the next line. And that was a little bit unexpected to me. Um, so it was interesting to hear him hmm. and, you know, read it and hit the way he intended it to be read. <laughs> And I, I agree can with you, Vicky. Links if you all want to track back and listen to it again yourself, I'll, I'll stick them in the Google Drive. So, any last words on this poem? I just no. want to say one, one thing quick. Sure. Uh, I come from a different perspective because I'm blind. Hmm. And so my place is, as far as what I can see, is the same place all the time, but my mind has to put me in the place that I need to be in. Hmm. And uh, I think of uh, Frank Crosby. If you look through the hymnal, you'll find so many songs that were, the words were written by Frank Crosby. Yeah. And she, she, she's totally blind. And she wrote over 3,000 hymns. So I, I don't want to go away from what we're talking about here, but there's a different, pers- you come from a different perspective that when, when you can't see. Yeah. So, so I, I just inter- interject that. For what that is fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs> but I agree with Vicki. When I started to read this, I first I was going to tell Steve, I'm going to pause at the end of each line so you can see that it's in lines. Well, that didn't work because of what Vicki was saying. He winds it around to the next line. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, that was at first unsettling to me. And even as I, the way I look at it, which Steve can't look at it and see it, but I'm so visual, 
I looked at that before I read it. And actually I had a whole lot of question marks. I thought, how am I going to read that to Steve that hmm. I can reject that to him? Because to me, the way it's written, the visual of it, I don't know. It's unsettling settling to me because I would make my divisions at different places. Yeah. I think <laughs> it know, speaks it, to movement. It won't let you yeah. It won't let you stop where you naturally want to stop. Right. It forces you to keep going, which is the unique kind of movement that is present here when, it's tell when the first thing it says is make a spot to sit down and then sit down. I think, it's, I think it's a beautiful use of language and the way the words actually show up on the page. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me is it says how to be a poet, mm. <laughs> but I, I had, reading it again and again, I had this thought of... Uh, it could say how to pray. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, isn't there a New Testament passage where Jesus says, when you pray, go to your room and shut the door and pray in okay. silence? Stay in your closet. Yeah. Yep. Now it you're... seems to be in the theme here yeah. as well. No, I agree. Um, and I'm glad you picked up on that because I want these agrarian themes. Like one of my convictions is Barry's agrarian themes. They're not perfect, but they can inform a different way of understanding spirituality. And so, yeah, I do want you to hear this poem of how to be a poet as how to be a person of prayer. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can draw that, that conclusion. And part of being a person of prayer mm -hmm. is being in the place where you actually are. Like so much, so much of our prayers are disconnected from our places, which we never were intended to be in the first place. Like that's not how we're designed. And so I, so I, I, I love that connection. I really, really do. So I'm going to stick a bookmark here because I do want to do Mad Farmer and then we'll do, um, we'll do Wild Geese in the, in the Google Doc. We can kind of hash it out over there. Is that all right? And we'll go till 110. Is that okay with everybody? We'll bang us out for 15, 20 minutes. I don't know. That's not enough for Mad Farmer, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll do the best we can. And I hope you're inspired to go back. Like, I hope this isn't the last time you read these things. Like, I hope you stick them in your Bible and come back to them from time to time. So, Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. First and foremost, what is a manifesto? Don't skip the text. Uh, it's a, is it a statement of ideas or, uh, yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I didn't look it up, but when I first saw the word manifesto, I said, uh-oh, communism or something like that. I don't know why. I associated the word manifesto. I would have bet my mortgage. Bad. <laughs> which I don't have anymore, um, that, that there would have been someone who made that connection. It's fascinating that we do that with that word. Mm -hmm. We presume it with a political stance. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, hey, thanks for saying it. Yeah, that's present. What is a manifesto? <laughs> well, I asked Alexa about that. And oh, she good. Gave me, <laughs> and she gave me, <laughs> me a meaning. And then she said, uh, if you want to know more, ask me. So I asked her, she said, I got more, four more meetings. By the time I listened to them, I forgot everything about everything. It's a What I did was I went to the root word, manifest, and all I, all I could think of myself was <coughs> a written statement that's been said or written. Read yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, so, yeah, so a, it is. a declaration. Yeah. Yeah. So declaration or statement, um, mm -hmm. the dictionary sure. puts it as a declaration of policy and aims. So it is, it speaks to goals, wider goals, it's kind of spiritual ethereal in that way, but it does speak to policy, like how shall we be? Okay, and it's important to realize, I mean, we're coming into a, we're coming into a season where there's going to be a lot of policy. We're going to talk a lot of policy. And so um, this is an interesting uh, submission. And I also want to know what you, what you made of the word mad. What did you hear when you read the title in the word mad? Well, I, I would say that I, I always feel like um, farmers are 
are, are committed to such hard work that the rest of the world sometimes looks at as madness. That, that's what I thought of when I, yeah. like, like it's just a commitment that most, most of society doesn't I read can't even it. fathom. Mm -hmm. I read into it angry as opposed to crazy. Interesting. <laughs> All right, let's do a vote here. How many of you read crazy? That's how I first come to it. I come to it as crazy. How many of you read it as angry? Interesting. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay, then we got to let these two, let's let these two things talk to one another. Okay, let's not assume it's either or. Let's assume it's both and see how they talk to one another. And then I also want to know the word liberation, what does that bring to mind? Or what does it mean? Freedom. 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 Okay. Freedom from oppression. Ah, yeah. See, when I hear liberation, I first think oppression too. Like why, like the question I would ask Barry is why did you use the word liberation and not freedom? Mm. Freedom is a, is a more accessible word, especially for white people, I think. Liberation it has, has other undertones to it, I think. And yeah, I, I also heard the word oppression as I read liberation. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on this idea of liberation? Well, I think from my standpoint, if I'm by myself and I want to go somewhere, I'm somewhat captive, captive okay? Yes. I'm liberated when I find a shoulder, usually my wife's shoulder, mm. and then I can go as fast as she can go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm liberated to that extent yeah. that I'm no longer in this little square of my own um uh, at that time so um for what that's worth so. steve i could listen to you talk about this all day long i'm learning so much <laughs> well I, from your I, perspective. See, I see freedom as a as a present tense word where liberation is present tense but it implies a past where there was no freedom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a attempt to break away from certain standards, usual ways of thinking. Um, whatever, whatever has been internalized either by an individual or a group and to challenge that thinking. Hmm. Especially in combination with the word fronts, the liberation fronts, yeah. you know, there've been all kinds of different independence movements around the world that have been called various liberation fronts and that I think exactly that kind of notion of breaking away from something um, whether it's a system or whether it's something internal um, but this is this is mm -hmm. a, a very sort of forward moving revolution kind of mm -hmm. language to yeah. me all right so power, let's to, power to the people versus the the organization. Yeah. I think so let's use important. Kevin's language here. Oh, I'm sorry, Abby. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, cause I think it dovetails with Kevin. Like it's also really important, particularly with Barry's stuff, I think to look at when it was written, it's 1973. Hmm. So the, the, the background of his, of like what America was going through, what the world was going through in 1973, definitely dovetails. I think what Kevin was saying about like the front and liberation and how those words and terms are being used in that in, in that period of time. Yeah. No, well, well said. And way to pay attention to the really tiny text at the bottom. <laughs> taking <laughs> in really taking in everything that is here. And so she's yeah. She's a good writer. She's a good writer, Sam. I I'm, I'm, I'm learning writer. that. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Um, and so let's use that as a jumping off point. So where is where is the oppression? And yes, this is not a trick question. This is pretty obvious. He lays out this oppressive kind of understanding pretty quickly. Where do we see it? What language feels oppressive? Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. Oh, goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Let's flesh all this out. Here it is. Yeah, I mean, the, the, those 
first 10 lines are just so brutal. Yeah. <laughs> when they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. Yep. <laughs> like faceless they, somebody who has this power, who can dictate the future, not even your future will be a mystery. Um, it's this such this dehumanized kind of nameless power um, that's so so striking the way he writes it. I mean, the first part, I think he's saying, you know, hey, be one of the money grubbing <laughs> bad guys. <laughs> Well, did anybody recoil from this? Like, knowing what you know of Barry, like, the first line is, love the quick prophet. Like, wait, 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 well, what? Like, how many of you read it, like, and I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but, like, kind of naively thinking, all right, Barry is going to say something very positive, and then we get this, or Barry is going to say something very genuinely, and then we dive into this poem, and it starts with, love the quick prophet, the annual raise, vacation without pay, want more of everything ready-made. Did any of you go, wait a second, this doesn't sound like Barry at all? I just thought he was being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, so there is this sense of cynicism. Like, it doesn't take us long before, like, oh, wait a second. Like, this is the cynicism of a dude who has been behind mules and has had a lot of time to think about a lot of stuff. All right, like, there is this, there is this harshness to his language. And yeah, and he gets annoyed by the end of this initial stanza. And I think it's I think it's really powerful when they want you, when they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. Um, yeah, they did let us know. How about that? <laughs> they did. I mean, this is like contemporary. What was the lieutenant governor of Texas told that anybody over sixty or sixty-five should be willing to sacrifice their life for the economy? Hmm. Right there, it's right out of contemporary news. <laughs> All right, now Robin, now 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 you've made it awkward, okay? Because you put the, <laughs> uh, the, Cana the Canadian will come in and soften it a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I just, that, that first part just makes me want, you know, like when you look at Wendell and you read a lot of his stuff and like, he just is so, he, like, you just want to love him. And he, he, like, he's like somebody who you'd want to hug in my mind. But this first passage, I can just imagine myself sitting off to the side when he loses it and going there he is yeah like oh yeah like i just would love to have been in that moment where he loses his crap and writes this first stanza <laughs> and and going yeah yeah okay he is like me yeah. he <laughs> Unfortunately, I do not have a recording. There may be, but I don't have a recording of him reading this. I neglected to play the recording I do have, but it reads it in this cynical tone. I, I, I will post that so you guys can go back later. Again, I want to be sensitive to our time. Um, but yeah, so, and I love, and I think it's important that we have this notion right at the end of this opening stanza to die for profit. I think that, and I think the notions of death are very prominent throughout this throughout this. And so he brings, so he identifies what the world, or a more secular understanding, or one might even say certain economic systems, how they understand our life, which ultimately brings us to death. But then I think he wants to talk about death in other ways, and this poem, I think, is all about contradiction. He does black, and he does white, and he sets them next to each other, and by, their, by the tension that these two things create, meaning will start to emerge. I think this poem is all about contradiction. And so I wonder if you saw any contradictions emerge out of particularly this middle section of the poem. Are there places where he puts two things against one another that don't seem that don't talk very neatly or nicely to one another, but nevertheless are trying to say something precisely in the tension that is created by having these two things so close to one another? I think he's saying like when he starts with so friends every day do something that won't compute, love the Lord. Like from that first couple of paragraphs, he's just saying something so awful you got to shock the system in a way mm. um do something for others and, and sadly that probably isn't as common yeah i love that idea of shock the system that is very much 
which almost feels like the craziness of the mad farmer. Um, you hear anger in the first part. You hear almost this craziness, shock the system, completely break all of this down. Other contradictions? Well, denounce the government and embrace the flag. Oh, <laughs> this will get awkward. <laughs> well, I was just gonna, as as a Canadian, I, we don't have the, the whole flag thing like you have in the U.S. So I don't even understand how you delineate those two things. So I think that for me was a, a real contradiction. How do you how do you do both those things? How did you all understand that? Because those lines are hard to hear in our current culture. American culture. I need to be more specific with my language. How did you all hear that or understand that? For me, I saw the flag as being what the what it represents, I guess, maybe freedom or the ideas that the country was, you know, theoretically founded on. And then the government is how those things are being lived out now. Hmm. Um, so hmm. how I made the distinction. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I, my, my brother and I had kind of had this conversation this morning, um, and I think of the, of our, our flag, our country flag, meaning united, and I'm not seeing that today. Mm. Uh, so I only, you know, I see a lot of flags waving and what have you, and, and, well, I can't get to um, anyway, I only put my flag out for special, special occasions, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, that kind of thing. But to have it flying all the time, it, I, I hate <laughs> seeing our flag flying behind a pickup truck. Mm. It drives me up the wall. <laughs> so anyway, so. I just find it, a, oh, well, it's upsetting. These I, I agree are... with I agree with what our Canadian friend said. <laughs> <laughs> hey Sam, These words are challenging. Yes, sir. Uh, when was this written? Uh, 1973. It could have oh, been 2020. Well, and that's it. Like, that's what good poetry does. That's why the Psalms still matter. Tw two thousand, no longer in two thousand years. Like, two three thousand years after they were written, they, that's what good poetry is. Good poetry doesn't speak to a unique moment in time. It takes that unique moment in time and says, hey, actually, these are realities you need to be thinking about. And here we are again. I think he's asking us to strive to, strive to always be better, to strive to, that the republic is as free as we would like it to be, too. I love the line, and it's a little bit farther, not too much, but the plant sequoias, mm. um, you know, invest in the millennium. It's... It's thinking ahead and down the road, and we're not perfect now, and there's a lot of problems, and you know we, we don't have to embrace, we don't have to agree with everything that's going on, but we want to strive to be better to our, our future, our children, our grandchildren, the world that's going to follow us, hmm. to, you know, to strive for that. You know, the, the flag, you know, I hear the stuff about the flag, and that's a whole other topic in some ways, but it's the free republic for which it stands. It's yeah. like, and I think really, if you go, if you want to talk about the flag, I think that's some of what people are saying. We we want this flag to stand for, um, you know, that we we want it to be free, you know, justice for all, and and we want it to be, um, you know, we want everyone to be able to experience the freedom that this and the this, you know, what this flag stands for yeah but he's looking towards the future and i i like the plant sequoias um you, you're not going to see yeah. that but you're 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 planting hope you're thinking ahead well it is this immediate work with super long term like it's a contradiction like i've always thought about plant squash because we'll plant it, it's a short-term thing, and it'll be dead in a couple of months. Plant sequoias feels like this tension of like, and it's the same thing, invest in the millennium, it's this short-term action with almost eternal consequences. It, it, it feels contradictory to me. I'm not sure how, but it puts these two, this short-term and long-term in contact with one another. 
I also reminds see me. Says, oh, sorry. Listen, oh, I'm sorry. sorry I, was, I was just gonna say real quick, like listen to Carrion, listen to the dead stuff, like listen to stuff that doesn't make noise, that actually has had its life taken from it. Listen to that. Like that feels like another contradiction to me. Abby, go ahead. I'm sure you have something more important to say. <laughs> oh no, no, no. I was just gonna say, like, and maybe I'm going out on a limb here. Um, it kind of reminds me of the whole story of Jesus, like the whole thing, like many different parts of it, like. There are, you know, Jesus wasn't always like um, quiet. You know, he went to the temple and like pulled everything down. And, you know, he was very um, aggressive around how you should, how you should make change in the world, but then also very calm in, in other ways and had that like sort of long-term vision. And then the end of the poem is about resurrection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like, it's actually interesting because I think this piece feels more biblical in some ways to me, like the way that there's just these different themes, um, living and dying, um, the government that, you know, that's, that's also a biblical theme. And, yeah. um, so I don't know, I, I was taken with that aspect, like the, the very subtle way that yeah. he may have done that. I don't know. No, I love it. I love it. I do. I felt the same as you, Abby. Like there's that whole kind of alpha and omega that is in this passage. Like that, that when, when he says the thing about put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees. Like that's just so put your faith <coughs> in the whole big scheme, the, the alpha omega um, eternity of it. Um, it the, both this poem and the other poem reminds me so much of the pro of Julian of Norwich, which is the name of my church, but also as the mystic. Like there's so much mysticism, I think, in in this poem. Yeah. So other last words, and then I'll sort of offer a last word, and we'll move this conversation to Google Drive. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Any last thoughts on this poem? It deserves way more time than we've been able to give it today. I appreciate that. All right, well, first of all, let me say, you all have done an extraordinary job with this poem. Like, I kind of want to bring some more poetry back because you guys have really thought through, um, and I've really enjoyed our conversation today, so thank you. I was scared to death. Every time I've tried to do poetry, church people just look at me. Like, are you serious right now? So I am really grateful that you all have engaged. But I do think this mad farmer idea, um, what we get is this, again, it's, it's built upon contradiction. And I love that that is part of this poem. And so, for instance, at the beginning, he says, not even your future will be a mystery. The idea that every single thing is known. And then later he contradicts that by saying, praise ignorance. Which is not the same way as saying, like, be ignorant in a very negative sense, but like, be aware of and celebrate that there are things you don't know that there are things that are larger and bigger than you, and that we don't have the entire world figured out. So it is this agrarian versus industrial theme, whereas the, the industry says know everything. Agrarianism says be very content with the idea that you don't know everything. Praise and celebrate that we don't know. There's an ignorance and a positive sense to that. I love when he goes down later, he says, say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into mold. Call that profit. And this word that he uses, profit, drives me right back to when he says that they will call you when it's time for you to die for profit. Well, he's saying, yes, death and profit do actually go together, but not in the way that the world is going to tell us how to die. He's like, the death that is profit is this creation of humus. It is this breaking down. It is this life that is actually encapsulated in death. So death is profit, but not in the way that we had thought. And I think this gets to what Abby is saying. This is exactly the message of Jesus. Jesus is saying through death, there is the message of life. And that's what, that's what a farmer, what an agrarian will see. You know, and then um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down to expect the end of the world Here's another contradiction. Most of us fear and put the end of the world out. He's like, expect it. Like, pretend that there are worlds end on a minute by minute basis, whether it's in, in death all the time. World, worlds are always ending. So expect it and then laugh. Like, don't hold it so heavy. Again, this contradictory kind of idea. 
And then he says, laughter is immeasurable. And so be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. That's the one that really puts a smile on my face. Yes, in the face of reality, in the face of all this death, in the face of all this destruction, um, be joyful. Not joyful as you've ignored the facts, be joyful as you have embraced the facts. And then ultimately, this poem wants to land. We've skipped a lot of steps here, but it wants to land on practice resurrection. And where I want to leave you all with that, I feel like this is another contradiction because we are used to talking about resurrection as an event, not as a behavior. It's a one-time thing, not as a recurring thing. And so the question I want to leave us with for today is, what does practicing resurrection look like? And I'm going to leave that just for you to, to sit with and to digest, and maybe you can drop a couple things in the Google Doc and we'll continue this conversation. Um, but practice resurrection. What might that look like for people who are committed to place and who are committed um, to maybe rejecting some ways of industrialism and embracing some ways of agrarianism? And so with that, last word to you all. Any last comments before we say goodbye? Now, I just wanted to say if anybody in my verse that I read last night in my quiet moments to church and back. If anybody wanted to know how I was driving safely and counted 19 deer, I did pull over. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there was a family from Vermont. <laughs> See ya. There was a family from Vermont vid videoing it. So it was something amazing Very to good. see. Anything else y'all? Very well done today. Good work. Uh, this, is, this has been my favorite conversation of the three. And so I really appreciate you guys making the, making the time and giving me the freedom to not pay attention to time in any meaningful way. So um, I will, I will uh, some stuff is already posted in the Google Drive. If you want to continue this and I will be sending out our next reading here in the next day or so. All right. Thank you. Y'all take care. Thank you so much. We'll see y'all soon. Bye. Bye.